My dear friends, I warmly welcome you all to your today's session of the CCA subject F2 managerial accounting. Dear friends, in the previous lectures we had discussed about what budgeting is and what kind of budgets can we make. Our today's lecture is also related to a special kind of budgeting that is known as capital budgeting. If you follow the Kaplan book, so this is the chapter for number 14 that you guys can find in the Kaplan book. And uh, before we move forward and begin this chapter formally, and before I actually explain this terminology of capital budgeting to you, let me tell you guys a brief background of uh, this chapter. Why is this kind of budget made? What is the purpose of uh, the production of this kind of budget? And uh, this would be a kind of a revision for you guys because you have studied this introduction briefly in your ACCA subject F1 that is now known as business technology and you guys might have uh, uh, studied accountant in business all right moreover uh, the details that I'm going to uh, uh, the things that I'm going to tell you the details of these uh, things will be studied later in your ACCA subject SBL all right so dear friends let us talk about the organization as a whole let us talk about a company so we know that in a company there are different layers of management the first and the most important layer of management in the company is basically known as the strategic management and this is the superior most management that mostly comprises of uh, the senior management and the board of directors the second layer of management is basically known as the tactical management and the tactical management usually comprises of the senior managers and the middle layer managers. Whereas the third category of management is basically the operational management and this consists of the middle management and the lower management. The strategic management is responsible for making strategic decisions. That is the strategic decision making. The tactical management is responsible for overseeing uh, the decisions that are for a shorter time period but much longer as compared to the operational management so generally speaking strategic management is basically uh, responsible for making long-term decisions that normally range from five to ten years and more that can be 50 years 100 year man uh, 100 year decision making etc a more uh, broader plan a plan for a very long time long oversight all right whereas a tactical management is responsible for making a plan that can be from one to three years etc whereas the operational management is basically that management that is watching over the day-to-day -day routines uh, the production the sales the purchasing the selling etc and this management is responsible for making decisions that might be for one week they can be on the monthly basis or at maximum for a period of one year dear friends when we talk about the strategic management process so the purpose of uh, strategic decision making is basically to offer a guidance to the company as a whole about how can we improve the performance of the organization. All right. Once the performance is improved, what will be achieved? Competitive advantage is achieved and you can say that if you achieve competitive advantage then automatically the performance can be improved whenever we are talking about the performance of an organization so it is normally analyzed by comparing its profitability with the, some sort of benchmark that benchmark can either be the financial results of that organization over the past years or it can also be comparison of the financial results of that organization with other companies or other factories in that particular industry and the third important reason for doing strategic decision making is to maximize the shareholder value because this is sometimes and if you talk about listed companies so it is mostly the mission and goal of all organizations to maximize the shareholder value now i'm not going into a detail of all these three terminologies however it is competitive advantage that i want to discuss a little further competitive advantage if you just explain it in layman language it is basically an explanation of the concept about how is our company better than our competitors 
this is basically you can say some additional value that we are offering to our consumers that the consumers cannot obtain from our competitors and this is normally because we have some sort of distinctive competencies and we have the capability of deriving profits from those distinctive competencies all right now let me just write it down over here that from where do competitive advantage is achieved let me just write it down completely over here first of all So I told you guys that competitive advantage is achieved if we have some distinctive competencies. What do we mean by distinctive competencies? Distinctive competencies means those strengths that our organization has. Using those strengths, we can perform better than our competitors. For example, we are superior from our competitors because of the efficiency, because the efficiency of our processes or we are superior to our competitors in terms of the quality that we are providing our customers with. We can also be superior with respect to the customer service that we are offering our customers and the after sales services. And we can also be superior because of some other factor such as cost leadership or some uh, unique uniqueness that we incorporate into our products that means we can be superior in innovation as compared to our uh, competitors so all these things are basically the different strengths that we have in our organization and these strengths are basically identified once SWOT analysis is conducted all right the second important thing is that we have the capabilities. By capabilities, I mean that we have the ability to derive profitability from our distinctive competencies that we have. And this capability can only be achieved if we have the ability to utilize our strengths and the resources that we have in a productive way so that we can achieve competitive advantage and thus and improved performance as compared to our competitors. So my dear friends, capability arises from two things. First of all, resources that our organization might have. And the second important thing is the utilization of those resources. Or you can say, uh, again, over here, we can write capability. We are talking about distinctive competencies and competitive advantage together that how from where do these things originate. So first of all, we are talking about resources by resources. We can mean either the tangible resources or the intangible resources. Tangible resources are basically those resources that we can easily touch that have a physical existence. For example, our machinery that we utilize in our mills, in our factories, the furniture that we have, the vehicles that we have, the office building, the factory building, cash, similarly other investments that we have made, all these things are basically resources, economic resources that can help us generate further money or generate profitability in future. Similarly, uh, resources can also be those economic resources, those things that can help us generate cash flows in future. All right. Moreover, uh, resources can also be intangible. Again, when we talk about intangible, so basically we are talking about uh, the international accounting standard number 38 uh, intangibles. Again, intangibles are our assets. For example, uh, the goodwill that our business enjoys in the market, the reputation. We have some sort of copyrights. We have some sort of mastheads. We have some sort of, you can say, formula approved. And we are basically obtaining royalty from people who are using it, etc. So all these things are basically our resources that can help us have an edge over our competitors. For example, we have made a certain formula and we have got it uh, patented. That means that only we can use that formula and nobody else can imitate us. Nobody else can use that formula. So now because you have a formula that can help you perform better as compared to your competitors so this means that your product that will result after utilizing that formula obviously that product will be uh, of a better quality might be or 
may be uh, your product is produced in an efficient manner due to which you have uh, succeeded in controlling your cost and thus maximizing your profitability etc so in order to sum this up in a nutshell let me tell you guys one thing that normally we are talking about resources resources generally mean the assets that an organization has and to be more specific the fixed assets or the non current assets that an organization possesses all right capability is the same thing that you have the ability to utilize these resources to the maximum benefit of your organization so dear friends whenever we are talking about strategic planning i told you that strategic planning has three broad purposes the number one purpose is to improve performance and the second purpose is to achieve competitive advantage and the third purpose is to maximize the shareholder value so let us suppose that you are the members of the board of directors of an organization you want to keep make the business flourish so obviously you will have some sort of ideas in your mind that over the period of time where do you see your business this is basically the mission statement the vision of the organization the goals that you want to set for the organization and the values that you want your organization to have all right so after these four things are established that means you have a mission and a vision of your organization you know the values that your organization will have and you have set the goals for your organization once the mission is basically known the purpose of the organization is known the second important thing is to make an analysis of the external environment that will give you guys an insight about the opportunities available in the outside environment in the environment in which the business is operating and the threats that are existing in the environment that can pose a hindrance towards the achievement of the organization objectives once we are done with the external analysis we then focus our attention on analyzing the internal operating environment and this will give us an insight about the strengths that we have and the weaknesses that we have and the limitations that we have so now once we know the purpose of the organization we know the strengths we know the opportunities and threats that are available to the organization and we are also aware of the strengths and weaknesses and limitations of the organization now the board of directors will actually develop a strategy so that the strengths of the organizations are utilized to turn them into the most favorable situation for the organization and also to develop a strategy that will help the organization to cope up with the limitations it has or the uh, what do we say uh, the limitations it has and the threats that it faces once the strategies are developed then the strategies are basically implemented so dear friends uh, in order to maximize the profitability we need resources and in order to plan for those resources this is one of the important part of the strategic planning process all right so dear friends whenever our organization plans for purchasing or investing in capital assets this is basically known as the concept of capital budgeting all right so dear friends let me tell you one thing that uh, whenever we spend anything whenever we spend money that means whenever money leaves our pocket or our bank accounts so all that ex all that outflow of cash all that outflow of money is basically known as an expenditure now expenditure is of two types one kind of expenditure is basically known as capital expenditure and the other kind of expenditure is basically known as revenue expenditure capital expenditure is normally that expenditure that is incurred for a long term purpose i purchase a car now obviously i have to pay to the car dealer or the manufacturer or the company from where i am purchasing this car either through cash or through some sort of uh, uh, liability that i will discharge later for example uh, paying through uh, the bank on a lease or similar arrangement for example notes payable etc or either i am paying through some other uh, exchange uh, transaction for example i am purchasing a car giving my existing car to the dealer in return and giving some additional amount of money as well all right trade in allowance etc 
so i have to spend some money means this is an expenditure but this expenditure will last for a long period of time we all know that if a car is maintained and it is basically taken care of so it can last for up to 20 years 15 to 20 years is basically a normal useful life or economic life of a car if it is kept maintained and in a good working condition all right so these kinds of expenditures are basically known as capital expenditures and they are actually capitalized as our long-term assets and when we talk about the presentation of this expenditure in the financial statements so they basically form part of the statement of financial position or the balance sheet of that particular organization whereas revenue expenditures are those expenditures that are incurred on a day-to-day -day basis for example i purchased a car that was a capital expenditure and this is basically a purchase of an asset capital expenditure is always the purchase of an asset or such an improvement of an asset that either enhances its useful life or it enhances its value to some material extent whereas when you repair that asset or when you try to maintain that asset all the expenditure incurred for this purpose is basically known as the revenue expenditure for example i purchased the car that was a capital expenditure but now i have to refuel it after intervals this is a revenue expenditure I have to uh, look after its tires so that they are well inflated. So this is basically an expenditure that is known as revenue expenditure. I have to keep its mobile changing after intervals. This is a revenue expenditure, etc. All right. So this is basically uh, two broad uh, categories of expenditure. Expenditure can either be capital in nature or it can be revenue in nature. So now let me take you guys to your book and let us see the concepts that we have to discuss today. So this is the chapter capital budgeting. And this is basically the overall uh, things that we have to discuss in this chapter. Uh, first of all, this is the name of the chapter capital investment appraisal. Appraisal is basically an English term. You guys might have heard a lot of time a word as performance appraisal what is performance appraisal it is basically an activity where the performance of employees is evaluated by the management and on the basis of superior performance or better performance or good performance those employees are rewarded and where the employees are not meet meeting the mark or they are not meeting their deadlines or some other things so obviously they are reprimanded for this and sometimes uh, decisions for retaining employees and for letting employees go is also made on the basis of uh, performance appraisal so appraisal is basically you can say an analysis of a situation so capital investment means investment made in capital assets or long-term assets it can either be an investment it can either be in a machinery it can either be any sort of asset that is intended to be used for some sort of business capital assets or long-term assets are basically very important for running a business a simple example is that if you do not have an office facility if you do not have a factory if you do not have plant and machinery obviously you cannot start a manufacturing business because you need to have some sort of plant and machinery to produce the products that you want to make even if you do not require any material asset even then human resources is important for example if you want people to be employed instead of machinery and they actually make the asset physically for you even then you need some sort of machinery for example in order to cut wood you need an axe all right so an axe is also you can say a kind of a capital asset because it has an extended useful life all right so capital investment appraisal means that making an analysis whether the investment that we are making in a capital asset is it worth doing it how will we calculate whether it is worthy or not obviously there are some certain formulae certain processes that we have to do that we will discuss later in this chapter but in order to give you guys the concept of what capital investment appraisal is it is basically a process that we analyze the transactions sorry we analyze our idea of investing in a particular capital asset 
and we see after uh, doing some calculations that whether investing in that particular asset will be beneficial for the company or not all right so we have to discuss the appraisal process we will discuss compounding and discounting techniques we will also see uh, this discounted cash flow techniques and the traditional techniques so capital investment is what i have told you already so many different investment projects exist including replacement of assets cost reduction schemes new product or service developments product or service expansions statutory environmental and welfare proposals all right so over here uh, there uh, cost reduction schemes basically is an other name given for introducing a new machinery that will help our operations to become efficient when our operations become efficient so there are you can say at least two implications the first implication is that lesser raw material will be used or if you rephrase the sentence in a better way you can say that more output can be generated from the entered amount of input all right secondly it is possible that the machine that you introduce that machine is capable of doing work equal to 100 employees alone so this means that cost can be controlled cost can be reduced by utilizing that machinery by investing one time in that asset and then for a longer period of time for a you can say extended period of time you can reduce your cost that you will have to pay the salaries and wages to the employees and obviously raw material uh, 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 normal loss and abnormal loss associated with them that can also be reduced all right so this is how this is what we mean by cost reduction schemes all right uh statutory or environmental and welfare proposals are basically sometimes imposed by the government in f1 you have studied the uh pestel analysis and you have studied that there are certain economic factors as well similarly the political and legal factors that affect a business so sometimes there is a statutory obligation on all organizations that they have to filter their waste before disposing them into the environment all right so obviously if our facility our factory facility does not has any uh, unit for refining that waste material so we might have to uh, invest in some refinery plant etc all right so again in other words you can say that this is basically a proposal for investing in a machinery capital and revenue expenditure you guys are now well aware about it and i want you guys to read this article so that you get more clarity all right capital budgeting and investment appraisal a capital budget is a program of capital expenditure covering several years includes authorized future projects and projects currently under consideration one stage in the capital budgeting process is investment appraisal this appraisal has the following features estimates of future cost and benefits of the project's life this is basically known as cost benefit analysis cost benefit analysis actually means that you analyze a project you make a list of all the different kinds of costs that will have to be incurred in order to make that process become real and on the other hand you also make a list of all the benefits or revenues that are expected to be generated in future because of investing in that particular asset once all these listings are made we make a comparison we see if the revenues are greater than the costs and if yes they are greater than the cost then how much benefit is there if there is a benefit of only a few dollars or a few hundred dollars obviously that is not much beneficial whereas if there is a huge benefit with respect to the cost that have been incurred and the benefits that are expected to receive then obviously uh, investing in that particular process is considerable on the other hand if the costs are more than the benefits then obviously this is something uh, not to consider at all so this is basically the purpose of doing a cost benefit analysis and the second thing is assessment of the level of expected returns earned this is the same thing that i have just explained you guys right now okay so overall dear friends the capital budgeting process consists of these six steps 
the first step is that we have to forecast capital requirements this is basically the part of the business strategy or the strategic plan that i explained you guys a few minutes ago because in the strategic planning when we see where when we actually decide that where do we see our organization to be in the future let's say let's suppose after uh, 10 years after a period of 10 years so obviously if we see our organization to be the top producing brand of the country or let's suppose of the world so obviously you will have to have enough capacity to fulfill your dream to fulfill your destiny all right so this forecasting of capital requirements is basically part of the strategic planning then we have to identify suitable projects in which we can invest and before we actually invest we make an appraisal of that process that means we conduct a cost benefit analysis the fourth step is that we select and approve the best alternative because we will have various options to invest we make a cost benefit analysis of all those uh, uh, options that we have and on the basis of the best results we select a project just like whenever we have to uh, purchase something we invite quotations from various suppliers and then we purchase from that supplier that offers the lowest bid all right then we make the capital expenditure and then on number six we compare actual and planned spending all right so dear friends now in the fourth article they are telling us what is the uh, why are cash flows used for investment appraisal yes my dear friends this is an important concept let me tell you guys as i told you that a cost benefit analysis is made so whenever we are doing the cost benefit analysis we do not use profits for benefit analysis cost benefit analysis rather we make use of cash flows all right this means that whenever we are talking about cost benefit analysis so we are not talking about our profits and our expenses yes we do talk about expenses but normally we are talking about cash flows why because as i told you guys earlier when we were discussing our cash budgets there is a different difference between cash flows and profit what is that difference they have discussed this difference over here in detail as well there are a few differences let me read them out for you revenue is recognized in the statement of profit and loss when it is earned but is it, but this is not necessarily when the cash is received costs are recognized in a statement of profit and loss when they are incurred but this is not necessarily when the cash is paid there are certain non cash expenses for example depreciation expense amortization expense for intangibles purchase of non current assets these are often large cash outflows of a business but the only amount that is charged to the statement of profit and loss is the annual depreciation charge not the entire cost of the non current assets similarly when you sell the non current assets so basically the amount of profit and loss that you have made in that transaction only that profit or loss becomes part of the statement of comprehensive income and not the cash receipts means that profit is different than the receipt of cash similarly financing transactions some transactions such as issuing additional share capital and taking out or repaying a loan will result in a large cash flow either in or out of the business but this will have no effect on the profit figure at all right so dear friends whenever we are making a cost benefit analysis there is one thing that we have to make sure the thing is that the cash flow should relate to future and the second important thing is that the cash flows should be relevant whatever expenditure whatever cost have been paid in the past they are done for they do not have any benefit to come in the future let me elaborate what i have just said whatever decision was made in the past that was for the past it will have no impact on the future for example before starting a project we made a feasibility study now we expended some money on that feasibility study we engaged some uh, firm to make an analysis of the uh, what do we say pros and cons of spending in that particular asset or that particular project that we were interested in 
and let's suppose that uh, the firm came up with the conclusion that yes it is beneficial for us to invest in that project now on the basis of this uh, feasibility study yes we will make an investment but there is also an other perspective that you guys have to keep in mind because i want to explain a concept to you it is also possible that the feasibility study was not in favor of us to spend in that asset what will we do then obviously we will not invest in that asset so what will happen to this cost obviously this cost will be treated as an expense in the statement of comprehensive income all right so dear friends all decisions that are taken in the past they are not relevant for decision making all right all those expenditures that have been incurred in the past are not relevant for future decision making therefore whenever we are making a cost benefit analysis we are actually talking about the future so only the future costs are relevant number one and the relevant costs should be used in order to make a cost benefit analysis because cost benefit analysis is a kind of decision making technique all right so now what are uh, how what, what kind of cost should we uh, consider future cost and revenues it is not possible to change what has happened so any relevant cost or revenues are future ones means or we are talking only about the future cash flows either cash inflows or outflows the second important thing is cash flows we are not interested in profits and expenses or losses actual cash coming in or leaving the business not including any non cash items such as depreciation and notional cost and the third thing is incremental cost and revenues incremental cost means any change in the cost of revenues that will be expected if we adopt a particular project now let's suppose that we are trying to invest in a particular project and in making the cost benefit analysis we find out or we already know before conducting that uh, benefit analysis that if we invest in that project there will be no addition in our costs or there will be no addition in our revenues so this kind of uh, the, uh, uh, any cost that will not be any revenue or any cost that will not be affected by initiating a new project such cost and revenues are also not relevant for that project all right for example i have a supervisor now i am paying this supervisor some salary he is working on salary with me for let's suppose 10 hours a day or 8 hours a day whatever the arrangement on the uh, is, uh, is uh, on the basis of the agreement i have with him so i start a new project now i ask my supervisor to look after two projects instead of one and i am paying him the same salary so in order to make a cost benefit analysis for the second project shall i include the salary of the supervisor or not obviously no why because i am already paying an amount to him and if i start a new project without increasing the salary of my supervisor this means that there is no additional cost for me with respect to the supervisor salary that i could include in the project b while making the cost benefit analysis for it all right so this cost means the cost of salary of my supervisor is not relevant in order to conduct the cost benefit analysis for the project b however if i increase the salary of my supervisors saying that now you have to look after two projects so you must uh, you, you you should have a raise so now the amount by which i am raising the salary of my supervisor this amount however is relevant to the project b because if he was not engaged in that project his salary would not have raised so this is basically an incremental cost that i have to pay because i am starting the new project all right so these are the different kinds of uh, relevant cost differential cost is it is basically the cost that i have just explained to you by giving the example of um, the supervisor opportunity cost is basically a you can say let's suppose that you have two alternatives you have 
an empty facility the two alternatives are that you can rent out that facility to someone and enjoy the rent income and the second alternative is to employ some machinery in that facility and start production and obviously sell that production now you have two choices and you have to select one what will you do you will make a cost benefit analysis you will analyze that what will be my income if i rent this facility to someone and what is my expected income if i employ machinery over here and uh, i start production and selling those products to the customers similarly what will be my cost if i have to rent out this facility to someone and what will be my total cost if i employ machinery and start production etc on the basis of this cost benefit analysis obviously i will select that option that will be more uh, profitable for me and my business however on the other hand i am declining the other choice that is available to me all right so the benefit that i am foregoing of the second best uh, second best alternative because i am choosing the first alternative this benefit foregone is basically the opportunity cost and opportunity cost is always relevant for decision making let me simplify this concept for you let us suppose that you have 10 dollars in your pocket now you have two options you can either eat a chocolate or you can either eat a burger now the choice is yours now you think that if i eat chocolate i will enjoy let's suppose this and this utility whereas if i eat a burger so i will have let's suppose this and this much utility i'm not teaching economics over here this is why i'm not incorporating the cardinal approach and the ordinal uh, ordinal approach of measuring utility all right just giving you guys an example utility is basically the benefit that you extract from something being a consumer all right so let's suppose that you decide to eat a burger means this is your decision now because you are eating a burger you have foregone the joy that you could have enjoyed if you ate a chocolate so the cost of purchasing the burger is to forego the joy the enjoyment the utility that you could have enjoyed if you purchased a chocolate this is the opportunity cost of purchasing a burger similarly had you purchased a chocolate instead of purchasing a burger so the utility that you could have enjoyed if you ate the burger that is foregone because we have decided to purchase a chocolate this is basically the co the concept of opportunity cost all right so opportunity cost is always relevant avoidable costs are those costs that are incurred specially for a project if you do not go for that project that cost can be avoided all right for example if i want to start a new business i will have to have some sort of facility with me facility by facility i mean let's suppose some sort of office building some sort of plant and machinery etc but if i do not decide to do that business obviously there will be no need for me to investing in all those stuff all those buildings all those machinery etc so such costs that can be avoided if a particular decision is not taken such costs are basically known as avoidable cost and obviously always the avoidable costs are relevant for decision making and over here there are certain kinds of cost that are non relevant sunk costs for example sunk cost means those costs that have sunk into an ocean now this does not actually mean that they are sunk into an ocean sunk cost means any cost that has been expended that has been spent in the past period any period in the past now any person who has died obviously he will never come back he can let's suppose that that person was a role model for you but he is not dead now he cannot help you in your day to day affairs is it right or wrong obviously it's right so any cost that has been spent is basically non relevant fixed costs for example they are they have to be spent whether or not anything happens or not let's suppose that there is a class 
there is a classroom now if there is one student the organization the college the university still has to have a class so that the student can sit and let's suppose that the class is full of students let let's suppose that there was a capacity of 100 students to study and 100 seats are filled by students so even then you have to pay the same rent and if there is only one student even then you have to pay the same rent for the room all right so this is basically a sunk cost or you can say a fixed cost committed costs are also the same thing any cost that you have committed to pay whether or not you receive any benefit or not this is also a sunk cost a kind of sunk cost or a non-relevant cost non-cash flow cost means cost for example depreciation that has no cash flow associated with it general fixed overheads i have just given an example carry amount of non-current assets this is also a non-relevant cost because accounting treatments or accounting conventions are used to find out what is the carrying amount of a non-current asset all right so this is basically a non-relevant cost this is an illustration i want you guys to read it this is basically regarding what kind of cash flows or what kind of cost will be treated as relevant and what kind of cost will not be uh, treated as relevant all right however there is something important in this example that i want to share so just give it a read a company is evaluating a proposed expenditure on an item of equipment that would cost $160,000. A technical feasibility study has been carried out by consultants at a cost of $15,000 into benefits from investing in the equipment. It has been estimated that the equipment would have a life of four years and annual profits would be $8,000 after deducting annual depreciation of $40,000 and an annual charge of $25,000 for a share of the existing fixed cost of the company. So what are the relevant cash flows for this investment? So dear friends, the only relevant cash flow is the amount of $160,000 that will be spended in order to purchase that equipment. This is the only relevant cost. Why? Because technical feasibility study is a, is a sunk cost and uh, we are not talking about profits right now. Moreover, depreciation is a non-cash cost and $25,000 is basically fixed cost. So fixed cost, as I told you, they are also a kind of sunk cost. So obviously these are also non-relevant. All right. Now, if there is a question that you face in an exam that how can you convert profit into cash flow? So what you have to do, you have to add all those non-relevant costs into the cash flow in order uh, in, into the profit so that it can be converted into cash flow. For example, over here, the estimated profit was 8,000. You add back depreciation because in the calculation of profit, expenses are reduced. So if you want to find out the cash flow, so you have to add back or re-add the minus already subtracted expenditure into the profit so that you can have a cash flow figure so you add back depreciation you add back a portion fixed cost and the annual cash flows can be calculated being being equal to seventy three thousand. all right so dear friends i want you guys to try test your understanding number one by yourselves dear friends there is an other important topic that we have to discuss today that is the time value of money let me give you guys an example let us suppose that uh, you offer me a choice you say that i want to you say that just choose one thing whether you want one thousand dollars today or you want a one thousand dollars after a week what will you choose obviously one thousand dollars today why should i let go this opportunity for seven more days if I have it now this will always be your answer that give the money today why because you know that the money the value that this money has today tomorrow this value will not be available how let me give you guys another example let us suppose that I borrow some money from you and I invest that money in a bank. Let's suppose I keep it in a bank. I have to pay this amount back to you after a year. So what happens? 
the thing is that i have to return 1000 rupees back to you after a year when the year passes by i return that amount to you but now this 1000 rupees has been devalued how it has been devalued because i have invested that 1000 dollars in a bank or in some project and that project or that bank gave me profit on an annual basis or a monthly basis on that 1000 dollars some sort of interest rate was involved and now that 1000 rupees that i have returned to my friend after a year it has reduced value as compared to the value it had when i borrowed that amount this concept is basically known as time value of money we will discuss this in detail let me just read it out right now one characteristic of all capital expenditure projects is that the cash flows arise over the long term a period usually greater than 12 months under this situation it becomes necessary to carefully consider the time value of money money received today is worth more than the sum same sum received in the future that is it has a time value for an investor the effective time value of money is due to number 1 cost of finance if the funds were available now the cash could be used to repay or reduce a loan in turn reducing interest charges on the loan let me explain this let's suppose that you had obtained a loan from a bank if you had money today you could repay your loan to that financial institution and this could have led to a saving of the interest expense that would have been payable on you had that debt remained unpaid let me give another example let's suppose that i have money with me i have cash i can spend it anywhere i want if i did not had that money i would had to borrow it from the bank and this would have a, at an, at an attached cost of borrowing that means interest expense associated with it all right so this is basically the value of money the second thing is investment opportunity if you have cash today you can invest it anywhere and obviously after some period of time that money will generate further money for you profits all right the third thing is inflation obviously uh the purchasing power that money has it reduces over time for example for 1000 dollars let's suppose you can buy a couple of things today but it is possible that after one year because of the increased inflation in the economy you are unable to buy the same set of things with the same 1000 dollars after a year why because of inflation the price level increases and the purchasing power decreases so this is the time value of money the fourth thing is risk risk means that obviously uh, if i lend my money to someone i would want it back as early as possible because the more the funds are not with me means they are receivable on my end the more is the risk that i will face some credit loss expense or a bad debt expense right so funds received sooner are more certain so i want you guys to give a read to this article especially this article that they have uh, uh, given a point of learning over here the time value of money there is another concept that is basically taught together with time value of money and that is basically the concept of interest all right what is interest you guys already know it but let me tell you guys that interest has basically two types one type is basically known as simple interest and the other type is basically known as compound interest there are two types simple interest and the second type is basically known as compound interest now having an understanding of interest and the simple interest and the compound interest you guys will easily understand the concept of time value of money in a better way now we all know that whenever we deposit our money into a bank account and if that account is a savings account in nature what happens 
that the bank invest that money somewhere else that can be any business and then uh, the bank pays us some amount every month or sometimes on a biannual basis or sometimes on an annual basis as interest it is basically a profit now there is a conflict if you talk about uh, islam whether this amount is basically uh, usable for us or it is basically not usable for us in terms of whether it is halal or whether whether is whether, whether it is haram we are not discussing that debate right now all right but i am just teaching you guys a concept that is important for us to study to learn what is happening in the economy as a whole so dear friends simple interest is basically a concept where there is a principal amount let us suppose that you take a loan from the bank what happens that uh, when you have to repay the loan you have to pay some amount in excess now that amount in excess is basically interest okay so how is that interest calculated on the basis of the method of calculation there are two types it can either be simple interest it can either be compound interest let me tell you guys the formula first of all in order to calculate simple interest there is a formula simple interest that i am abbreviating over here as s dot i is equals to p multiplied by r multiplied by n where p is basically the principal amount principal amount is that amount that you obtained as the loan for example i was in need of ten thousand dollars i borrowed that money from a bank so uh p is the principal amount that means ten thousand dollars is the principal amount r is the rate of interest r is the rate of interest and n is basically the period for which that amount is outstanding now this is something critical it can n can either be a period of one year or more than one year it can either be periods it can be divided in the form of months and sometimes on the basis of weeks so this is something critical that we have to analyze while solving a question that we have to identify the pattern of periods whether it is monthly whether it is annual or whether it is weekly all right so let us suppose that uh, the principal amount that i borrowed was ten thousand dollars and the bank agreed a rate of ten percent so i multiply this by 0 0.1 and let's suppose that the loan was outstanding for five years so this means that the total interest that I will have to pay to the bank is equal to five thousand dollars, right? And also I have to pay the principal amount back to the company as uh, to the bank as well. So this means that the total amount of money that I will have to repay the bank will be the sum of five thousand and ten thousand. This becomes equal to fifteen thousand dollars. So there is also a formula for simple interest. This is basically the future value that I have to pay to the bank. Let me just highlight it in yellow and write future value against it so that you guys understand the concept. The amount that I have to repay the bank after the maturity period of this loan. This is basically known as the future value that I am abbreviating over here as F dot V. All right. So there is a formula that is used to calculate the future value future value is equals to present value or principal amount plus p multiplied by r multiplied by n that means the formula for interest so in order to calculate the future value let us use the same example 10000 plus 10000 multiplied by 0 0.1 multiplied by 5 And this is calculated to be equal to fifteen thousand. So this is basically the formula that you that we use to calculate simple interest. 
Now compound interest is basically something a little bit complicated and different as compared to simple interest. Whenever we talk about compound interest, so a concept comes into our mind which says interest over interest. In simple interest, the amount of interest is basically the same. Means that if this period was 1, means the interest was for 1 year, so what will have been the value let us write it down over here the interest would be 1000 since it is for five years so every year the amount of interest will be 1000 all right whereas in compound interest this is not the case every year the amount of interest changes by 10 percent let us suppose now giving you guys a random example of uh, compound interest before i tell you guys the formula let me assume that uh, this is the first year where I obtained the loan from the bank and the total period for which I obtained bank uh, a loan was five years n is equals to five years and the amount was 10,000 the principal amount for which I obtained the loan was 10,000 all right yes this is not $10,000 now for year one, the interest is basically by using this formula of simple interest, it is PRN. So P multiplied by R multiplied by N, this gives me 10,000 multiplied by 0 0.1 multiplied by 1. This is the interest for year one. It is $1,000. Now for year two, the total balance shall be calculated first. The total balance in my account is now $11,000. I am writing it in bold. Now in year 2, the interest percentage will be calculated using 11000 as the principal amount. So now, in order to calculate this, what I will write, I will write 11000 multiplied by 0 0.1 multiplied by 1 because again I am calculating this interest for year a single year. The period is 1. Now the interest is calculated to be equal to 1100. For year 3, before I calculate the interest what I have to do, I have to calculate the sum of my existing account balance and now it is calculated to be equal to 12100. And now this interest percentage will be applied on this and then the interest for year 3 will be calculated. Now as you guys can see, the amount of interest is basically increasing every year. In year 1 it was 1000, in year 2 it is 1100 means that there is an addition of $100 in the interest. In the third year it is 12100, so this means there is a further addition of interest in year 3. Let us calculate it, 12100 multiplied by 0 0.1, this gives us 1210, so when you subtract 1210 and 1100 you find out that now there is a further increase of ten dollars in the third year so this means that the value of interest does not remain the same in compound interest rather it changes every year so there is a formula that we use to calculate the future value for uh, future value means the amount that we have to pay after the maturity of this uh, loan etc so the formula for compound interest is future value is equals to present value or p into 1 plus r raised to the power n now p is the present value or the principal amount r is the same and n is also the same so now let us suppose that uh, we have to calculate the future value P is 10,000 as I told you guys earlier and uh, 1 plus 0 0.1 that was the rate and now let's suppose that we are talking about uh, 5 years so we raise this to the power 5 this is basically the answer that we get this is the future value that after 5 years we have to pay $16,105 approximately 
and the principal amount was 10,000. So this means that we have to pay an additional $6,105 in future. So this means that $10,000 that we borrowed today, they are equal to $16,105 of tomorrow or after five years. After five years, the value of $10,000 today will be $16,105. So this is basically the concept of time value of money. So dear friends, we take a break today and in our next lecture, we will discuss more things about uh, capital expenditure and how do we make different kinds of cost benefit analysis. Thank you.